I decided to rank every Conjuring Entity's power on a tiering system. When I say everything, I mean it. There are two comics and multiple short films in this verse that hardly anyone knows about. I will be ranking every main entity on a system that goes from absolute trash to the god tiers. Most people think that Annabelle is the strongest in the verse, but let me tell you he does not even come within the top 5. With that said, let's hop straight in. Also there will be spoilers. In 1863, a man by the name of Judson Sherman built a farmhouse. He was married to a woman by the name of Bathsheba Sherman. Judson and Bathsheba settled down and had a child at this farmhouse. When the baby was seven days old, Bathsheba sacrificed it. Judson caught Bathsheba doing this. Bathsheba then proclaimed her love for Satan, cursed anyone who tried to take her land, and hung herself in the backyard. Bathsheba was a relative of Mary Town Esty. Mary was accused of witchcraft in the Salem Witch Trials and put to death. Mary passed down her her knowledge to Bathsheba. Years later in the 1930s, the land was sold to a woman named Walker. Bathsheba possessed this woman, killed her son Rory, and then committed suicide. This happened all over the property. In one home, a maid committed suicide. In another, a boy drowned. People went missing without a trace. With that tragic story out of the way, how strong are the people killed by Bathsheba? You see, these spirits did not pass on and stayed tethered to the farmhouse. Rory is the weakest of the spirits. He can only manipulate people. In The Conjuring Tales from the Artifact Room, a comic made by DC, we see that he manipulates a girl into killing her husband. In the original Conjuring movie, he manipulates Cindy into going into a crawl space that he used to hide in. Rory never takes direct action, not to mention he is bound to a toy wind-up box. For that reason, he's going straight into the skill issue tier. Sorry, kid, you should've killed someone. Rory's mother is not much better. She's kind of fast, and with her sheer mass alone, that would put her in the street-to-wall levels of AP. She's not a hostile spirit and is, a. Uh not built for fighting, so straight to weak tier. As for the maid, she emerges, starts teleporting, and startles a man. She does nothing, but for the teleportation, I'm gonna put her right below Walker in the weak tier. It goes without saying Bathsheba is stronger than all of them. Bathsheba has showings of street-to-wall level telekinesis via casually throwing people around. At one point, Ed and Lorraine attempt an exorcism and Bathsheba shakes the farmhouse. I'm not going to lie, shaking feats are way beyond my pay grade to calculate. I guess it is around wall level to small building level. Speaking of the exorcism, Bathsheba's weaknesses are unknown. She shows resistance to a normal exorcism and holy water, as she decides to do a little trolling during it. We also don't get much info on Bathsheba's speed. It is fair to assume that with her telekinesis alone, that would put her in the superhuman range. As for Bathsheba's hacks, she has shown the ability to make curses. As in her backstory, Bathsheba cursed the land so that bad things would happen to anyone who took it. Later in the film, she curses anyone she possesses so that if they leave the home, they die. Bathsheba has also shown some form of electromagnetic field manipulation. Throughout the movie, we see that her presence alone is enough to make birds hit the house. Birds navigate with electromagnetic fields, which implies Bathsheba can manipulate them. She presumably uses this ability to delete the recordings of the family's events in the farmhouse. All this is enough to justify to me that Bathsheba belongs in the strong tier. Speaking of those recordings, Bathsheba has some ability to attach herself to items. She attaches herself to the tapes and infiltrates the Warren's home. While there, she pulls Annabelle out of her case. Annabelle's spiritual power was enough for Bathsheba to pull her out. This might not seem like much, but within the Conjuring verse, Annabelle attracts weaker beings. This simple interaction implies that Annabelle is above Bathsheba. In Annabelle Comes Home, Annabelle gets loose and the same effect happens, making all the artifacts in Ed and Lorraine's room go crazy. This raises is a question. How strong are the artifact room entities? Well, let's start with the spooky ghost dress. In the comic Tales from the Artifact Room, we get a lot more information about this dress. A woman by the name of Quinn Lane caught her fiancé cheating the night before her wedding. And you know, as anyone does in this situation, she kills five people and steals their eyes. What did the other three do? Anyway, she goes on to haunt her dress. She can possess anyone who wears it, or as shown in Annabelle Comes Home, the mentally weak. As opposed to all that, she has, like, a knife? You know what, for that she gets mid-deer. Furry, I mean a uh, werewolf. There's not much to say about the furry man. He's an overgrown dog that has intangibility. He has demonstrated superhuman feats of speed and power as expected of large dog. To me, this only puts him above the Quinn Lane dress because all that power is treated for dog intelligence. Do you wanna know what's better than a furry? 
Psychic powers. In Enemo Comes Home, the fairy man can teleport, use telekinesis, and illusion magic. In Tales from the Artifact Room, he might have some sort of probability manipulation. A kid by the name of Everett Mailer was at a funeral. Everett was challenged to take a silver coin out of the mouth of the deceased. Feeling peer pressured, he did it and forgot about it the next day. One week later, his parents died. Soon after that, a car crash at his school. He would go for periods of time without bad luck, only for him to get happy and the fairy man to collect. You can argue the fairy man is manipulating prob realistic outcomes, but it's also possible that he's directly causing these events. That said, the ferryman has a major issue. The comic book implies that he can only do these actions if you take a coin, and if you give it back, he will stop collecting. For those reasons, I'm putting him solidly in the mid-tier. Speaking of probability manipulation, let's talk about the one entity that stands out. The one and only Accordion Monkey. <laughs> There are some things we know are evil. Call it instinct, call it divine warning, but some things elicit in us a powerful reaction to the devilry contained within. Perhaps the way that thing appears, or by the air that seems to hang around it sometimes. By whatever means, we just simply know. Nurse Bellwether, a pillar of stability, suddenly became fiercely paranoid, accusing the roots of harboring a child that was not theirs. Her implications led to physical confrontation. I was left with no choice but to fire her and recommend her committal to the colony and training school of the indigent and epileptic. She did not take this news well. Hoping to calm the roots upon release, I gave them a little toy I had found. A concertina playing ape. Soon after, Joey and his new friend arrived home. Terrible things began to happen. When Joey was 11 months old, his father's best friend was run over by his tractor. At 18 months, an unusually fertile tornado season destroyed every standing structure within three miles of the roots' home. When Joey was two, the family cat gave birth to six kittens. Each one of them turned inside out and writhing in short-lived agony. It seemed every six months, some unimaginable horror occurred. Culminating this week when Doris Root was stricken with debilitating stomach pain, which I suspect may have been a large intestinal tumor. Through it all, the monkey played its squeezy box. I was searching through Miss Root's files, hoping to discover some family history to explain her illness, when I found it, a drawing. Amateurish and shaky hand, but clearly depicting a newborn stalked by some indecipherable but menacing black form. Beneath that, pages upon pages pages removed from what must have been ancient pagan books, depicting runes and Latin text. I recognized the words, Benedicto Genus Daemon, and finally, in the depths of the file, a receipt for a toy that I had found on the floor outside my office four years previous, signed Marine Bellwether. Did she see upon the birth of the Root Boy some primeval human force take him from his crib and replace him with something else? Did she then attempt to warn the family citing the attacks on the newborns that I had blamed on wayward rats? Failing this, did she turn to ancient occult rituals bonding some angelic spirit, some totalary deity, to an artifact that could raise alarm whenever it was made aware of impending demonic action by the Antichrist himself? Aw, isn't that sad? Terrible things happen sometimes. But you always make me feel better by playing that song, don't you, Jocko? Because I know... I'm the only one who's listening. Benedicto Genus Daemon. This translates to Blessed Guardian Demon. This demon can manipulate probabilities and is guarding the Antichrist himself. This demon possesses enough power to cause 1 in 1 million events and level 12 square miles of building. It also has enough control over these actions to kill someone getting too close to the truth. Without a doubt, this thing goes straight into the don't come within 500 miles of meteor. Annabelle is one of the most mysterious demons in the Conjuring verse. Even so, what do we know about it? In 1943, a demon called Malthus inhabited a grieving family's doll, posing as their dead daughter, Annabelle. The family caught on and locked the doll away. Twelve years later, in 1955, Malthus manages to escape its containment by manipulating a curious child. Malthus then killed Annabelle's parents and possessed the girl who released him. Years later, when Malthus was following a cult, he managed to get his vessel killed killed. Conveniently, the same doll was nearby, so Malthus possessed it again. This is where the events of the first Annabelle movie take place. At the end of that movie, Malthus stole someone's soul, but could not get his hands on a vessel. The doll ended up in another home, except this time, when weird stuff started happening, the people had more than two brain cells and got help from Ed and Lorraine. Ed and Lorraine decided to take the doll and put it in their artifact room. On the way there, Annabelle's power attracted some spirits. The spirits tried to kill Ed by pushing him into oncoming 
traffic. Once they got back to their home, they put Annabelle in a special case. Ed and Lorraine labeled it the devil itself, showing that it is the strongest entity in the room. Years later, once again, a curious girl managed to release Malthus. Once he was released, all the objects began to act out of control. In light of this, who in the world is this demon? During Malthus's occult activities, he painted a symbol in blood to repossess the doll. We learn later in the original Annabelle movie through a grimoire that this symbol represents a demon by the name of Malthus. That same grimoire calls Malthus an Earl of Hell. This implies he is a rather high-ranking demon. Because of the lack of information, I decided to look into actual demonology. So I now have a PDF of an actual grimoire known as the Lesser Key of Solomon. What are your hobbies? Within the Lesser Key of Solomon, Malthus is an actual demon but the book calls him Halfass. The book describes him as a great earl and appeareth in the form of a stock dove, and speaks with a hoarse voice. His office is to build up towers and furnish them with ammunition and weapons, and to send men of war to places appointed. He ruleth 26 legions of spirits. The main thing of importance is his rule over 26 legions of spirits. Generally, the more spirits under a demon, the stronger the demon is. Through Malthus' journey, he shows consistent wall-to-street level attacks of telekinesis, putting people in hospitals, bending people in odd ways, and even cutting someone in half. He displayed high levels of manipulation and spookiness intelligence, which means Malthus is good at wearing people down through fear. Along with telekinesis, Malthus has shown levels of speed above human perception. Another possible explanation for this is simply teleportation. He also shows some level of non-physical interaction, as well, he's a demon that can steal people's souls. Malthus has one of the highest ranges in the verse, affecting large buildings with its tomfoolery. With this in mind, how does Annabelle lose? Malthus on many occasions could have completely screwed over the Warrens. In Annabelle Comes Home, Malthus could have run away or killed everyone in the building. Instead, he simply decided to resort to a a little trolling. This means Malthus has an IQ of 2, or he wants to be in the Warren's home. I frankly don't know. Either way, it does not change the fact that Annabelle goes straight into the Hell Knot tier. Annabelle is strong, but far from the strongest. Speaking of things most people don't know, let's talk about My Annabelle Creation. My Annabelle Creation was a short film competition for the film Annabelle Creation. Participants in this competition were to create short films reminiscent of The Conjuring. The winning films would become canon to The Conjuring verse, and there would be a total of 5 winners. Out of those five, four of them are public on YouTube. Even the Conjuring vs. Wiki would not link to them. I managed to eventually find a playlist that I will link in the description. Now how strong are the entities in these short films? Well, only two of them are worth mentioning for scaling. In the short film What's Wrong With Mom, a girl and her implied father are praying, with her mother bound. The father leaves as the doorbell rings, thinking it's the Warrens. The power to the house is then cut, and the mother is gone. The girl gets up and then gets thrown across the room. This shows that the demon is either fast or can teleport. It also has access to telekinesis, as you know. For the reason that this entity is not limited like the ferryman, I'm going to throw it at the bottom of the strong tier. In the short film, Confession, a girl recounts her experience with a paranormal entity. The being shows the ability to screw with electromagnetic fields and transmutation. For the sheer speed of this being and its ability to change form, it goes right above the demon from What's Wrong With Mom. Out of the five, only two had scaling. Ignoring the Umbrella Man. No one talks about the Umbrella Man. Wanna know what else no one talks about since it sucks? Lyadona. Oh my god guys, Lyadona is boundless! Straight into the god tier. Oh my god. The Conjuring 2. Fine, I'll talk about the stupid ghost lady. Lyorona is an inhuman spirit that was once human. Lyorona was a beautiful woman who had a family and kids. That's the end of the story. Nothing else happened. Except, you know, she may have done a little trolling and drowned her kids. No, oh, Lyadona, stop. It's too late for an abortion. God being the based, woke, red pill, liberal he is, decided to bind Lyadona to the earth so she could continue doing her favorite pastime. In her 300 plus years of drowning children, she picked up on a few abilities. One of these being copy and paste. I don't know how she does it, but who cares? She can also give someone an epileptic seizure by fancily spamming a light switch. Lyadona has also shown some ability to do the same thing a lighter can and burn you. When she grabs kids to do her relaxing pastime, they get burns where her hands were. Like most powerful spirits, she can use telekinesis. <coughs> 
I cannot keep that voice up. Lyodona shows superhuman speeds that alone give her street to wall level attack potency. One thing unique to her is that she has some form of mind hacks, as she can make kids sleepwalk to her. This is inconsequential, as she only uses it on kids with mothers. So don't be a kid, or get rid of your mother. You heard me. Do it. Come on, do it. Or hit her with a tree. With all of Lyodona's powers, she does have some weaknesses. Holy items like holy water can deter her and a type of wood. You can unironically kill Lyodona with sawdust. Begrudgingly, I will put her above the confession entity. In contrast to Lyodona, let's talk about something actually interesting. The Nun. The Nun, like Annabelle, has spirits attracted to it. In The Conjuring 2, the Nun has control over two spirits. The first one is an old man. He displays the ability to throw objects and screw with electromagnetic fields. He's consistently around human to street levels of power. He's also intelligent. In the movie, he was able to actually trick the Nun. He did this by sending encoded messages in his speech. For this reason, I will put him at the bottom of the mid-tier, barely evading the weak tier. The other entity that is under Valak in this movie is the Crooked Man. For some reason, a lot of people think that the Crooked Man is Valak. This is not true. The Crooked Man is bound to an item, and at one point was going to get his own movie. So the Crooked Man is not the Nun. In any case, how strong is he? The Crooked Man displays the ability to use transmutation as he disguises himself as a dog. He can also possess people on a whim for a short period. The thing I want to focus on is that the Crooked Man has a Toon Force-like way of moving. I'm not saying he has Toon Force, but he just does stuff because it's swoopy. For example, he uses a wall to travel through and then just pops out of a closet in a cartoonish manner. Not to mention the fact that he just disguises himself as the neighbor's dog. He simply just does weird stuff and it works. On top of this, whenever he travels through the wall, it's pretty fast and leaves a huge crack. It's reasonable to say he has superhuman speed and wall level AP. For this reason, and the fact that he is a dapper umbrella, I will put him above Lyadona. There is one more entity the nun has control over, a demon that possesses a boy by the name of Daniel. In the first nun movie, we see Father Berg exercise a demon. This demon came back to torment him throughout the film. Throughout the movie, the demon commonly uses snakes. Volok's other name is the Marquess of Snakes. A Marquess is a British nobleman ranking above an earl and below a duke. This implies that the nun is in fact above the Daniel demon. Now how strong is this demon? In a flashback, we see that during his exorcism, the demon managed to shake a building. Once again, shaking feats are beyond me to calculate. If I were to guess, this would be around wall level based on the size of the shed. All things considered, I will place the Daniel demon right below Bathsheba. In a time long before the earth had form, there was an angel. God rejected this angel and stripped it of its holy power. This fallen angel watched as the earth took form and saw God care for the beings on this planet. He saw as he gave some holy powers. This infuriated the angel. He stole my divine birthright and now permits those fools to wave around crumbs of my magnificence. This god will regret this decision. But this demon could do nothing. Stripped of power with no way to get it back, he spent years thinking, long enough to come up with a new name, rejecting the one given by God. He called himself Valak. Years later in the Dark Ages, there was a castle named St. Carta. Within that castle lived a duke. This duke abused his divine birthright and became a devil worshipper. One day he figured out how to open a gateway to hell. Valak saw this as an opportunity. He could not kill God, but he sure knew he could kill the ants that were posing as the divine. He would prove God's decision wrong. The ritual was ready, but before Volok could do anything, the ants he looked down upon for so many years stopped his reawakening. Not only did they stop his one chance at retribution, they decided to claim the castle for their own, calling it Holy Land. Years passed, and with each second, Volok's hatred for humanity strengthened. Until one day, war had managed to open the portal to hell. Volok was finally free, but there was one issue. The constant praying of the nuns around the church had bound him to the location. Volok had no care at this moment. After years of being in hell, he was finally out. Volok took his time dismantling and tormenting the people who dared to take his freedom away. All while doing this, he took the form of a nun, mocking God for calling what could so easily be dismantled divine. Volok was no longer Volok. He was Volok, the Defiler. No, the Profane. As time passed, he got bored of killing the nuns, and craved more. Among his years of spectating in hell, 
there was one nun who was held above the rest, Saint Lucy. God had for some reason given her more power than the others, maybe even enough to get his powers back. But there was nothing he could do. The powers of Saint Lucy had long been hidden, and he was still bound to the church. That's when Volok saw him, a French-Canadian farmer. If he had a vessel, he could escape. Through The Conjuring 2 and the first and second nuns, Vogt does a lot of crazy stuff. The thing is, we don't know if he's doing it through impressive illusion magic and intelligence, or if Volk has reality warping. We do know that the nun is superior to Annabelle. Going back to the Lesser Key of Solomon, this is how it describes Volok. He appeareth like a boy with angelic wings, riding on a two-headed dragon. His office is to give true answers of hidden treasures and to tell where serpents may be seen. He will bring and deliver to ye exorcist without any force or strength. He governs 30 legions of spirits. If you remember, Malthus only has 26 legions of spirits, which shows that Annabelle is weaker. When it comes down to on-screen showings, Volok is also more impressive than Annabelle. Annabelle influences a big building. The Nun influences a castle. Annabelle shows aspects of telekinesis. The Nun shows aspects of telekinesis, pyrokinesis, thermokinesis, electromagnetic manipulation, and even some aspects of precognition. For example, the nun in The Conjuring 2 knows Ed might be impaled on a stormy night. If the nun does not have precognition, then he has some level of weather manipulation. This is because a lightning bolt formed the tree to be sharp. Either way, the nun's showings are far beyond Annabelle's. Not to mention, Valak has access to esoteric knowledge. In The Nun 2, a librarian at the Catholic Archives describes the nun as infinite during its time on Earth. He says this about all demons. For that reason, this is more than likely hyperbolic. At the very least, Volok is thousands of years old. The Nun was around during the times of fallen angels and even old biblical events. The Nun also shows an ability to know things simply by looking at you. The Nun looked at Maurice and simply knew he was French. He also looked at Irene and knew she had not taken her vows yet. In The Nun too, he plays dead to get his powers back. Speaking of his powers, when he gets them back, he shakes a huge school and uses flipping earthbending. In The Conjuring 2, he manages to enter Lorraine's visions from a different continent. In the original Nun, he manages to tank the blood of Christ. With all of my hyping up of the Nun, it does have a weakness. What could beat the blood of Christ and other holy objects? Its name. Yeah, you can yell at it and tell it to go back to hell while using its name. I question the Conjuring verse. Frankly, I'm going to choose to stay in denial and chalk it up to Lorraine being very strong. For all these reasons, it gets to go above Annabelle and the Hell Nazir. So is the Nun the strongest in the verse? He's a uh, top five. <laughs> Throughout the Conjuring movies, we get a lot of hints at stronger beings through grimoires and other texts. For example, the demonology book in the original Annabelle movie mentions a being by the name of Lial. Vlial is described in the Lesser Key of Solomon as the 68th spirit. He is a mighty king and powerful. He was created next after Lucifer and is of his order. He appeareth in ye form of a beautiful angel sitting in a chariot of fire, speaking with a comely voice. His office is to distribute performance of senatorships and cause favor of friends and foes. He giveth excellent familiars and governeth 80 legions of spirits. This being has 80 legions of spirits. Assuming legions correlate to power, this means that he could beat Volok and Malthus combined not even trying. He goes straight above Volok. Within the same grimoire, another king of hell is mentioned, and in verse it describes him as Beleth, the mighty king of hell, commands 85 demonic legions. This correlates exactly to the lesser key of Solomon, which describes him as a mighty king and terrible, riding on a pale horse with trumpets and all other kinds of musical instruments playing before him. He is very furious at his first appearance. He is of the order of powers, and governeth 85 legions of spirits. The order of powers part references an ancient Angel hierarchy. Within Christianity, there's an angel hierarchy separated into three parts, the highest orders, middle orders, and the lowest orders. Powers, also known as authorities, are part of a middle order. Beleth was once this type of angel. These angels have power over evil, which makes sense as to why Beleth is a king of hell. Beleth has five more legions of spirits, so he goes right above Vlial. Both of these demons are kings of hell, and some of the highest demons within actual demonology. With this being said, how do you go higher? Well, that's simple. Actual angels. Revelation 9 verses 1 through 11. 
Modern English translation. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. The star was given the key to the bottomless pit. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke ascended from the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the pit, and out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. Power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or anything green, or any tree, but only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were given authority not to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. In those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will desire to die, but death will elude them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On on their heads were something like crowns of gold, and their faces were like faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running to battle. They had tails like scorpions and stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months. They had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek his name is Apollo. Apollyon. Abaddon in Hebrew simply means destruction. In Greek, Apollyon means destroyer. The angel of the bottomless pit is simply an agent of destruction and commands locusts. You could argue that these locusts are symbolism for demons, and the pit is symbolism for hell. Now I don't know if Abaddon is a divine judgment figure or a fallen angel. If Abaddon is an angel, he would be a moral judge and commander for punishment during revelations. If he is a fallen angel, he is the commander of a demonic legion. Either way, it puts him above everything we have seen so far. So I will make a new tier for this man, as he could beat everything combined below it. So is the Angel of the Abyss the strongest in the Conjuring verse? No, that honor goes to God himself. Specifically, a modified Catholic interpretation is blatantly shown throughout the movies, with the blood of Christ himself being an actual holy object. God stripped every fallen angel of their power, and based on the Bible, is omnipotent and created the very universe. God is the strongest in the verse, but there is still one entity I would not want to encounter. This being is arguably the most dangerous of the Conjuring verse, and she does not hold punches. The major antagonist of The Conjuring 3 is Isla Kastner. Isla Kastner is the daughter of Father Kastner. Priests in the Catholic Church are required to keep a chastity vow, thus he had to keep her hidden. He raised her in a storage farmhouse. The church saw it as a no-go zone as demonic relics were housed beneath the property. He tried everything he could to keep Isla away from the demonic, but all he succeeded in doing was creating a fascination. Isla moved to West Germany, where she discovered a mentor for demonic knowledge. She got close to her tutor, but this was insufficient for her. One night when they were sacrificing several individuals, Isla turned on her mentor, stabbing her in the chest. She reasons that this will make them connected. Isla is a bit unhinged, highly intelligent, and is not afraid to kill someone. Most of the beings in this verse never kill someone outright. Malthus will wear you down and put you in the hospital. Isla will murder her father in the middle of his speech. I found as a priest. I failed as a father. Please God, don't let me fail. Right there, she blatantly uses teleportation. She does not care. Isla has access to totems, which she can use to curse individuals and cause them to hallucinate. Totems have the unintended consequence of killing everything in their location, so she placed one of the totems beneath a waterbed to mimic water damage to the wood. She placed another totem in some get well flowers to make it appear as the flowers have died naturally. Isla needs three killings to complete her plan, the child, the lover, and the man of God. For each of these, she needs the subject to kill another person before she can make them kill themselves. So whatever she does in the film that appears to be an error could be her attempting to attract the man of God, Ed Warren. She begins the movie with the lover already dead. We can see how this happened in the comic, The Conjuring the Lover. Throughout the story, we follow a girl by the name of Jessica. Isla torments her to the verge of a mental breakdown. She does everything to where it appears natural for her to murder her best friend and then herself. The whole time, Isla was causing Jessica to hallucinate. This led to Jessica falling off the edge of a cliff. Isla was so precautious that she 
set up a trap so that anyone who went too close to the edge would fall off. Throughout the movie, Isla shows authority over various beings, the most important of which is a demon. This demon can halt a person's heart, causing Ed to have a heart attack. We don't know much about this monster, save that he demonstrates street to wall level AP. Isla, no matter how brilliant she is, is still human, and has the anatomy of a human, which this demon turned into a pretzel. Isla's arsenal, attitude, and intelligence, to me, earned her a spot at the top of Strong Tier. With poor little Rory being at the bottom, and God himself being at the top, we have finally finished the Conjuring Verse tier list. Make sure to do all the things that people ask you to do at the end of a video, including yelling your opinion at me in the comments if you think I got something wrong. I'm sure I missed something within the Conjuring. There are a lot of random demonic references where I can't read the text. This was optimized, and I'm going to go purge my eyes after reading Blessed Key of Solomon. See ya!